Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Uh, very good morning and welcome. This is the third Sunday uh, of Easter. Uh, over 40 days following Jesus rising from the dead, he appeared uh, to his disciples and he did it in many ways. Some of them were very casual, uh, meeting with them, eating with them over food. And some were surprising, appearing out of nowhere. But every time, uh, the disciples were usually surprised and were always filled with joy. So may our worship today, as we come here to meet the risen Christ, be joyful uh, and be a joyful encounter for each of us. A few words on screen now. They're taken from 1 Corinthians. And we'll say these together. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. Where, O death, is, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to bow our heads and pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you again that we can and do come together to worship you. Lord, we often come to church with many and varied expectations of what we will receive and what we will get out of it. Lord, may you swiftly remind each of us that it is not about us, it's about you. Lord, help us all to engage in all aspects of this worship service with open, repentant hearts, seeking forgiveness, seeking wholeness through a deeper adoration of you. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and he is among us now. May he make himself known to us in our worship, and the teaching of your word, and the fellowship of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have our opening hymn now, He Will Hold Me Fast, and as usual we are to remain seated with our face masks on. <coughs>
for that. That's becoming a some, some common else classic, that song, I think. Great tune. Just a few announcements uh, for you before we uh, continue our service. Um, our Sunday school, uh, our meeting again online, and that's uh, started again this morning from 9.30, uh, so it's just a wee half hour before uh, the main services. <clears throat> so that's going to continue now in the weeks ahead. Uh, a few exceptions to that are the 2nd of May, where it won't be on due to the bank holiday. And also to note that on the 23rd of May, we will have a Children's Day. We don't know what shape that will be, but we'll do our best to do something. Uh, depends what we're allowed to do. Um, confirmation classes are continuing again. Um, we're halfway through our course. Uh, we have three more Zoom sessions. The dates are on screen there on Thursday evenings. And we are going to try and meet together before the actual service. And really because confirmation is a celebration, and uh, we do have a lot, there's 15 of us of young and older folk at this, so uh, we do want to celebrate it. So we're going to try and do something. We're getting our thinking caps on uh, to celebrate that, whether it be after the service, possibly in the hall, we don't know, or during the week. Uh, but we'll do something to mark that uh, fact that 15 people are making a commitment before their church to Jesus. Prayer meetings. Uh, we have a prayer team here that have been uh, faithfully um, praying for you all and the needs of this, this parish and this community and wider uh, throughout lockdown, uh, and they have been very busy. Uh, I want us now to be able to meet again in person. So from uh, Wednesday the 28th of this month, we're going to try it monthly now in the evenings. Uh, from 8 p.m. we'll be meeting here for a prayer meeting. Um, the only thing is you just need to let me know if you want to attend. Uh, some days you just come along, but for this, let me know just so we keep right in terms of numbers and the required spacings that, that are needed. So please let me know if you'd like to attend that. Our online uh, Bible study uh, continues again. We're starting again on Tuesday the 27th uh, on Zoom, and that is going well, and we'll be finishing off that Meeting Jesus resource <clears throat> a few more weeks to go in that also just finally just to say that our easter general vestry uh, happened last week uh, took place and that all went very safely and well and uh, it uh, was a success so we all have a new set or both churches have a new set of vestry members uh, to to help uh, guide this church ahead so i'm just going to invite and ask the vestry members who are here to stand up for a wee moment, if you could now, that would be great. Thank you very much. So we are just going to pray now as a church uh, for our select vestry uh, uh, in the days ahead. Let's pray. Lord God, the life and the future of this church is in your hands, and we trust you. But Lord, we ask you to help us. We ask you to guide us. We ask you to guide and to sustain each member of our select vestry. May we, as a vestry, Lord, make decisions that honour you, God, that point to Jesus. And may you bless us as we seek to help this church and this community uh, grow deeper in their faith and know you all the more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> the real reason to get them to stand is so you can clap eyes on them. And if you have any problems, you go to them and don't come to me. They're the first point of contact. Uh, but seriously, play, pray for uh, your vestry and the leadership of this church going forward. Please do that. And uh, if you have any concerns or questions about how church happens, let us know. Uh, please. So we take a moment now to uh, confess before God our own feelings. In John chapter 20, it tells us that the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. In this Easter season, may each one of us bring our fears and our feelings to the risen Christ. Lord God, for when we have faced uh, 
difficulties in our lives and challenges, and yet we revert to sinful attitudes. Lord, have mercy. Lord, for when we allow past hurts in our life to damage our current relationships, Christ, have mercy. Lord, for when we face difficult times, but we fail to trust in your loving purposes, Lord, have mercy. Lord, for when we look inwards to our own selfish concerns rather than outwards to a world in need, Christ, have mercy. Finally, Lord, when we are agents of gloom rather than messengers of hope, Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on each one of us, forgive each one of us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our colleague for today, special pray, prayer for today, the third Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. I'm going to invite George now to give us our Bible reading. Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked of them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Probably my most favorite thing to do in this life is to make my wife laugh, okay? To do something to make her uh, giggle and lose it. Sometimes I manage to do it with my sharp wit and uh, sharp uh, uh, humor, but more often than not, it just happens when I do something just plain stupid and she takes her dead end, as they say. <clears throat> One thing that happened, uh, that makes her tickle the most, I would say, is when I try to sing, because uh, when I try to sing, it's never in tune. In fact, it's always out of tune, without a doubt. Uh, and probably one of the moments where she's laughed the most has been when I told her about a story uh, about me in a Bible study, which I was leading in St. Patrick's in Ballymena. Uh, in that Bible study, they would have a hymn at the start and at the end of the wee study. Uh, and there was plenty of folk from the choir involved in that, uh, traditional folk. Uh, and one evening there was no piano, or the, the lady who would normally play the piano wasn't there, so they had to sing a cappella, okay? And I, for some reason, volunteered to get us started, to get everyone in tune, to get us in the right note. Uh, and this was the point when I was telling the story to Jen that she bust out laughing and spat out her tea. 
uh, and, and couldn't control herself. The very thought that I would be leading these people, setting the tone for them, uh, for their singing. And uh, I did give it a go, and it was, there was plenty of laughter in the Bible study too, and they started again with somebody else. <clears throat> the point is, I'm not the most in tune man in the planet, and the most out of tune man in the choir here uh, would do well to keep me uh, at bay. Uh, I would stand out like a sore thumb and uh, ruin the whole shebang. Uh, so it's important, obviously, for any choir to be in tune. It's why the choir and Michael or Anne and Portland Owen, why they meet together and why they practice so that they are in tune. Put a wee picture up on screen here. I wonder if you can all recognize what that is. Maybe the kids, do you know what that is, Matthew? Have you seen one of those before? Matilda, no. You all know what that is, yeah? Tune and fork, yeah, yeah. I, I just remember it from school. Uh, it wasn't because I was using it properly. It was because I was banging it on a table and putting it up to people's ears and things like that. Um, that's tune and fork. And uh, keep it up for a wee while, Jack, could you? Those are used, obviously, for uh, musical groups, for orchestras to be in tune to all that'll be a C note or whatever, and they all set their instruments or their voices or whatever uh, to that tune, so they're all in tune. A.W. Tozer once said that the church, or should I say the members of the church, all need to be sure that they are in tune with each other. Here's how he put it. He asked this question. He asked, <clears throat> has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other. They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. And he goes on. So then, he says, 100 worshippers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they possibly could be uh, were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for fellowship. In other words, if a community of worshippers meet together and they're all looking to Christ, they're more in tune than if they are looking to each other, trying to be united you know, in their fellowship. If we are all, as individuals, separately, each one of us, we're looking to Christ, then we are in tune. Jesus is our tuning fork. This is us. We're together. We're working through God's together, word together, aren't we? We're learning. We're growing, hopefully. Developing together as Christians. That's what we're doing. If we're all looking to Christ as our yardstick, as our tuning fork, that will mean that we are in tune, that we are automatically united in many ways. It's not about you all being Rev Christie people. Good job too, I can hear you saying and say. It's not about you being attuned into me, your new church leader. It's not about you all being tuned to anything else. It's not about you all being organ type people traditional worship type people, modern worship type people. It's not about you being robes people. It's not about even, God for, heaven forbid, you being Church of Ireland people. Fine in their own right are all these things. But you're not to be tuned in to any of these things. You're to be tuned in to one thing, and one thing only, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. That's why you'll notice I bang on about him quite a bit. That's why to some uh, people's dismay, I don't worry as much about robes or organs or the Book of Common Prayer or even the style of worship. Obviously, the words we sing and the words we use in liturgy are so important. But they're only important to the degree to which they point to Jesus, to the degree to which they ring true with the tuning fork of Jesus. I don't want you to be tuned in to me. I want you to be tuned in to Jesus. I want you all to like me, of course. 
I want you all, and this is a very worldly thing, I want you all to speak well of me. So in a sense, I do want to be tuned in to each of you as individuals. But the truth is, that is so dangerous. Because we can be tuned in to one another. You can be tuned in to someone else in this church very well. But you can at the same time be out of tune with the real thing that we're supposed to be in tune with Jesus. Now as we look ahead as a church and our vestry have uh, got themselves together again and we have been um, I've been here nearly two years now and we're, we're looking forward and maybe to some of you you'll think hardly anything has changed in two years others might think far too much has changed in two years for your liking um, but on the anticipation and I was talking to the vestry about this the anticipation that we are going to recover now from COVID hopefully God willing and then alongside that our confidence will grow and we'll be meeting together more we will be aiming my hope is we'll be aiming planning to move forward together through this next year aiming to deepen our Christian faith as individuals and as a church and deepening the faith of those around us who don't know Jesus. But be assured that anything that might change or anything that might stay the same, it's all going to be about that tuning fork, about Jesus, about it ringing true with him, tuning us all into Jesus. That's what it's all about. Let's all get on with just doing, just doing that. Let's look at this text uh, before us that George has read for us. Obviously, you would uh, not expect a group to be more tuned in to Jesus Christ than the very people who have been alongside him, who could see him, who have access to him, who are with him, his disciples. In our short passage today, we have encounters with the risen Jesus for these disciples. So we look at verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a spirit. At this point, Jesus has risen. They have had... Uh, just recently, the, the, the discovery by the two women of the empty tomb, uh, and they're excited, and then they run and they tell the rest of the disciples, you remember? And in verse 11, if you have it up in front of you, uh, it says that they thought it was an idle tale. Uh, they didn't believe these ladies. Remember that idea we talked about a few weeks ago? These disciples are writing things into the scriptures that embarrass themselves. Almost makes you think it must be true. Peter then ran to the tomb himself, investigating it, and he came away marveling. And he was still perplexed. He was trying to work out what is going on. He was trying to get in tune with what was happening. And then in parallel, we have the road to Emmaus, which just comes before that passage. That story you all know well, I'm sure. Two followers on a journey, uh, going away from Jerusalem, dismayed, confused about what is going on, what's happening to their lives, they encounter Jesus, and they're excited. They turn back and go to meet them. Verse 33, they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, telling them their story. They wanted to pass that on. And so verse 36, as they were talking, Jesus stood among them. So at this point, they are not at peace, these followers. Jesus gives them the standard greeting, peace be with you. But they were not literally at peace. They have just had their leader crucified in Jerusalem in front of the whole world. And now they're hearing these reports of stories, rumors of Jesus being alive again. And they are totally unsettled and fearful. And it says they are startled and frightened. Jesus then asks, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? 
Look, it's me, he says, I'm not a ghost. See my hands and my feet, verse 39, touch me and see. And they still didn't believe it, apparently, it says, for joy and marveling. It seems that they're so excited and in this weird state of uh, frightened and fearful and yet excited about this potentially being Jesus. And why they were all marveling <clears throat> with their mouths wide open, touching his hands in excitement and wonder and disbelief. Jesus does a wonderful thing. Lovely bit of detail here. He asked in the middle of all this, have you any date? Get the pan on. They gave him fish and he ate it before them. That's, I like that because obviously these disciples are, are agitated. They don't know what's going on. Trying to work it out and Jesus just calmly sits and eats in front of them. As if to give them a few minutes to just get their head around things. To see him eating as someone who's obviously a, not a scary ghost. And they begin to realize this is him. And then he begins to explain, verse 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Sure, didn't I tell you all this? Do you not remember? That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Basically, everything you guys know from the scriptures... From the Old Testament, they didn't call it the Old Testament, it was just the scriptures to them. Even the bad stuff about me suffering, don't you see? Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That would have been a Bible study to be uh, attending, I would say. I don't know what Easter represented to each of you in your hearts, and your minds. But I hope it was a massive retuning for you all. Maybe that's how we should view Easter every year, as an opportunity for each one of us to retune ourselves to Jesus and what he is all about. A mass retuning once a year. That's what Jesus is doing right here. Jesus is tuning in his disciples to the truth. You see that he's appearing to them, he's tuning them in, meeting them where they're at, setting the record straight. Do you know, do you see, asked Jesus, the full picture now? <clears throat> Verse 46, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. The Christ who suffered. I had to suffer, Jesus says. I had to die and then rise again. Why? So that? Now what, Jesus? So that now, verse 47, so that now repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So that now repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. I know many a minister gets a bit of stick for going on about repentance and sin and forgiveness of your sins and all those things. Some ministers get a lot of stick for repeating that. But I want to task you. Can you blame them when you read this scripture? If you think about it, this is the very moment where this church starts, where the Christian faith begins. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appearing to his closest disciples. He's setting them down and he's explaining to them, here's what happened. That's what was said would always happen in scripture. And here's why it happened. Repentance and forgiveness of sins for everybody, all nations. Go and tell them. Is it any wonder you might hear that message pretty often in church? He doesn't say, so that now uh, the people of the world can follow my example 
and be good spuds and be nice to each other and make the world a better place and sort out climate change and all those things. So that now repentance and forgiveness of sins, that's the big reason should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. You are witnesses of these things. Think about it. This is the beginning of Christianity. Jesus risen from the dead. He's speaking to his closest disciples and he gently tells them that this is what it's all about. This is the main thing. Jesus came to earth to die, to rise again. Believe this. And this was done so that people, all nations, can repent and be forgiven of their sins. That's why. Are you tuned in to that? To this fundamental reality? That new life is available for every soul on this planet. Every person. Are you tuned in? Are you ready and prepared to tune in others? Jesus' disciples, by being in his presence, being in his very presence, were tuned in to him. It took them a while. That's why scripture is so encouraging. These guys messed up again and again. And Jesus had grace and patience and compassion to lead them to the truth. They were tuned in by his presence. May we as individuals, as a church, be tuned in to the truth of what he did, why he did it, and may we be ready to tell others. Let's pray. Our response to merciful Lord is, hear us, we pray. Merciful Lord, hear us, we pray. Father in heaven, we pray for those who, like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, like the many who were in that locked room, we pray for those who are confused in their faith, who are maybe despondent about their own lives and how things have turned out for them. Lord, we ask that you pray, or we pray that you bless anyone who feels distant from God or who feels out of tune with the message of the gospel. Lord, please help them to that place where they see and experience Jesus as the way, as the truth, and the life. As the one to center their lives around, as the one who brings real hope, true contentment, genuine purpose. Grant us, Lord, that we may encourage each other in the journey of faith and know Christ's presence as we learn from the Scriptures. Merciful Lord, hear us, we pray. Lord God, we pray for the church. When, as the first disciples found, telling others about Jesus would be hard, it would be met with opposition and apathy and hostility. Even for them, evangelism seemed fruitless and numbers could be low. Inspire us, Lord, to find new ways of proclaiming the gospel to today's culture, to 2021 in Ahokal and beyond. Lord, inspire us, your church, as representatives of this faith that started all those years ago in Jerusalem. Help us to speak truth, to show compassion, and to point to Jesus. Merciful Lord, hear us, we pray. Lord, we pray for families who are suffering from losing loved ones. We pray for, of course, the Windsor family, in particular the Queen, following the death of Prince Philip, her lifetime husband. Lord, we pray for the family of Reverend John Anderson, who's from our own diocese here in Connor, and who died at 46 of COVID. 
and leaves a wife and three children behind. We pray, Lord, also for those families in our own community who have recently lost a loved one. We pray for the Hayburn family, the Houston family, and the Leach family. Families who all continue to know the grief of losing a key member. Lord God, we ask that you make your mighty, saving, healing, comforting, guiding presence known to these families as they adjust to life without someone they love. Merciful Lord, hear us, we pray. We pray, Lord, also for those who are ill within our communities, within our families even. Lord, we have many. The list of our prayer team is very deep and it continues to grow. There are many who are, whether they're suffering from cancer, there are those who are about to or have recently undergone an operation, there are those with complex health conditions and there are those who are suffering mentally from anxiety or addiction or depression. Lord God, we continue to trust in your good and holy will. We do not demand a pain-free life, but we do ask for your help and we ask for real comfort and healing for those who are suffering the most. May they know your presence in their lives and may they all the more lean into and rely on you for their daily walk. Merciful Lord, hear us, we pray. We ask all these prayers in the name of our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In these times, I am endeavoring, and I have been endeavoring to keep us in a strict time slot. You know, 40 minutes, I think, is that right, George, is what I'm supposed to keep it to. And quite often, I go beyond that and have to apologize. Uh, but it looks like we might make it today for a change. I'm going to say our final blessing uh, before our closing hymn. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is, There is a Higher Throne. <clears throat>
that we can live lives that honour you as individuals, as a church community. Help us, Lord, be tuned into Jesus and all that he offers in life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>